Coming up on Nebraska Stories, the return of a historic artifact following a drop of water from the Rockies to the Plains, NU Volleyball's own hometown Husker, delivering catharsis through poetry, and a photographer captures the world of rodeo. a slight shininess from mm -hmm. whatever the finish is yeah. on it. And I think that's, that's how it catches the light. Anita Breckbill and Hannah oh, Jo yes. Smith are on the adventure of a lifetime, and it all revolves around a famous composer, an iconic performance, and a tiny piece of wood that ended up in Nebraska. It's a story that started nearly 150 years ago. The baton is an artifact, and it's an artifact of uh, unique performance. But this isn't just any baton, it's a baton German composer Richard Wagner used to conduct a small ensemble on Christmas morning in 1870. He had written a piece called Tripschen Idol as a birthday gift to his wife Cosima. It was performed on the staircase of their home in Switzerland. It was later renamed Siegfried Idol and became one of Wagner's most beloved works. The baton that Wagner used for that performance uh, Cosima kept that as a, a, a treasure, and she sent it off to be engraved by a, a local artisan there in um, Lucerne. Right, inscribed right. the 25th of? December, 1870. Right, yeah. And on the other side, the name of the work? Tribschner et al. Right. Let's fast forward to 1945. World War II was ending, and American soldiers, including Army Captain Bob Pearson, were in the streets of Bayreuth, Germany, the location of Wagner's second home, Von Fried. Allied forces had bombed the city and Wagner's home had been damaged. He saw there was this big pile of stuff out in the rubble and he told me, <laughs> he bent over and picked up that little shiny thing and stuck it in the pocket of his jacket and went on his way. Pearson returned home to Michigan with the baton and that's where it stayed for the next 50 years, a well-guarded secret among his family and friends, including Hannah Jo Smith's father, Philip, who worked with Pearson. In the mid-1990s, knowing his daughter was an aspiring musician, Smith traded letters he had from counterculture icon and author Aldous Huxley to Pearson for the prized baton. I think when my father realized that I was going to have a career in music, that he wanted, wanted to find a way for the baton to come to me, um, knowing that I would be able to discover more about the baton and care for it in a proper way, um, acknowledge it, honor it. This is where Hannah Jo Smith's friendship with Anita Breckbill enters the story. Anita was aware of the Wagner baton Hannah Jo had been given by her father. Anita's late husband, David Breckbill, just happened to be a Wagner scholar and classical music reviewer and asked to see the baton. He was very interested not just in seeing the baton, but in handling it, right? And about sharing what he knew about the baton with me because I was really, I, I understood what it said, how the baton was inscribed, but I didn't understand the connection, what that really meant. The name of the work? Tribschner et al. Over the years, now with a better understanding of the baton's unique history, Hannah Jo Smith and her friend Anita Breckbill talked about returning it to the Wagner family and having it displayed in the Wagner Museum in Bayreuth, Germany. Anita's husband Dave had died and it seemed like the right time. Do you remember when you first started suggesting this, the, the, that the baton could go home? I think the first time I saw it. <laughs> <laughs> right. But, um, yeah. Which would have been in the mid-90s, mid probably. Uh -huh. yeah. Bob Pearson had since died. I certainly didn't want to start the process until I knew that he couldn't get in any kind of hot water for having picked up mm -hmm. this baton. And I like to believe that the baton came to me because destiny saw that that was how it should be. 
You didn't have any trouble taking a hold of it, did you? No, no, I didn't. For Hannah Jo Smith, letting go of her connection to one of classical music's most accomplished composers, a gift from her father, wasn't easy. At first, I was really hesitant to go to begin the process of starting to return the baton. And yes, I suppose I've become attached to it, but for most of the time that I've had the baton, it's been in my safe deposit box. I'm hardly attached to it. It's more attached to Wells Fargo than it is to me. <laughs> After negotiations with the Richard Wagner Museum, it was time for the baton to finally go home. A nearly 5,000 mile trip from Lincoln, Nebraska to Bayreuth, Germany. I really am greatly relieved to have it go home, to be where it can be honored and appreciated by more than just the community of Lincoln, Nebraska, but by anyone who has an interest in the work of Wagner and the archive of Wagner, um, and to be with the other objects that the Wagners treasured so much. So the Feshbiel House, built in 1872, do you remember how hot it was? It was outrageously hot. I'm so Back glad. home in Nebraska, their adventure over, Anita and Hannah Jo haven't had second thoughts about returning the baton to Germany. They've been guardians of the baton, as they say, and helped get it back to where it belongs. Every German that I spoke to about this story was overwhelmed with the idea that I would uh, gladly and willingly part company with that baton. I was strongly affirmed in my decision to make that trip and to take the baton home. And I've been grateful to Anita for the, the support and guidance that she's provided every step of the way. It's been great. Today, we struck out across the plains, and we're really sort of starting that long, slow glide downhill. I love the mountains, and I miss them already, but I'm in love with the plains. Photographer Mike Forsberg and filmmaker Pete Stegan are in the midst of an adventure. They're following a mythical drop of water over 1,300 miles from its high mountain source in Wyoming through its journey down the Platte River until it joins the Missouri. It'll take almost two months on bike, on foot, in a canoe. But why? We are primarily made of water. All life on this planet depends on water. I want us to know where our water comes from. They've traveled for 35 days, overcome every challenge, and at last they've made it to the Platte. A braided river meandering east through a state named for the river itself, Nebraska. Flat water, a river full of surprises. That's a new one. Yep, it's done. What just happened, Pete? Well, I'm having a little quicksand issue. And we only got one crock. So that's what we had to go over. Get around anyway, not go over. Go over it and you're dead. We can get around it one way and do maybe about a quarter mile. Uh, maybe even half mile portage. Light as a feather if you stick together. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> I got it. 
Pete's looking for a opening in the dense cattails so we can get around this thing and I'm walking the boat slowly hauling our gear. Here's our path. Should have brought the machete. I don't see what the big deal is. Found a way. Nice work, Pete. You too. And then, the biggest obstacle of all. Eventually, we weren't in a river anymore. We were in a lake. The river becomes a lake, and things are going well, and the wind starts to pick up. So we got waves in our boat. We're going across these waves, so a little, little bounce in the bow. They had entered 22 mile long Lake McConaughey. When we entered it from the river, you cannot even see close to the dam. Like it's, it's massive. Once these waves started happening, we started thinking maybe this isn't safe. And then this gate swings open and closed like this. Nate Nielsen, foreman of Kingsley Dam, portages Mike and Pete past Lake McConaughey over the earthen dam and sends them on their way. There was a lot of work for those guys. They, uh, they had a lot of fun, I think, but they, they were working hard. There are surprises hidden beneath the water. I picked it up, pulled it out, and like sand started pouring out of it, looked at it and held it and thought, whoa, this is a bison horn. Like when was the last time that bison have been around here? Before we started putting these bridges, before we started getting a handle on the wild, the wild was here. And it was everywhere. There's so much before me. There's been so much before I have stepped in this sand. On day 55, the last full day of their journey, the river has one more surprise for them. I had the tent set up and darkness had fallen and there was lightning flashing off in the distance. It's almost like it was a show for us, you know, it was like building and growing and lightning. That was probably the most intense storm that I've ever been in. The walls were sucking in and blowing out and sucking in. And it was crazy. We woke up the next morning and everything was glistening. The river had risen almost to flood stage. And the clear river with braided sandbars that we had been paddling through for several days prior all of a sudden was a chocolate milkshake with you know, huge piles of, of foam and huge upwellings coming from below, you know, like just, like just big belches of water coming up. And we sort of looked at each other and thought, well, we got like 14 miles to go and we can't stop now. This is amazing to see this. Well, it seemed like the water was saying, you're done, time's up. You followed me all the way to the mouth Time, time to get out. They have reached the place where the Platte River becomes the Missouri. Thank you there. Nice work. This river is me. This river is you. And if you live in this basin, it's, it's you. It's, it's, you should care where your water comes from. I think it's, it's so fundamental that we almost overlook it. We have this tiny little wedge of water 
that we all need to survive. We all need to be able to share it. We all need to be able to understand it. That's a pretty powerful thing. Malcolm's a really small community, so we're really close, and it's just like a family, so you know everyone, everyone knows you, and it's just such a fun community to be in and be a part of. <laughs> I have two older sisters, Brittany and Morgan, and they're quite a bit older than me. I was already in junior high when she was born, so um, she pretty much kind of grew up following us in our activities. She went to her first high school volleyball game at two weeks, and so her life revolved around her sisters and their games. When she was four or five years old, she already was trying to have competitions on how many times we could pass it back and forth. Whenever I was growing up, I was always looking up to them and trying to be like them and try to beat them. We're very competitive. And now watching her as a Husker is as much of a dream come true for us as it is for her. It's really cool. And an ace out of the timeout, so the Huskers tie it up. She was always a hitter growing up, even though she's only 5'9", she jumps pretty well. The better the competition, the harder she seemed to play and work. I never dream she'd be playing in Nebraska because I never thought she'd give up the hitting part of it. It's like every little opportunity you just have to take full advantage of. So you may not be out there every point or every play, but every ball that you are out there, you just got to make the most out of it. And that's what I think I did last year. It's just a completely different mentality, but I love it. It's been such a good transition and I think I've taken it to heart. And so I'm getting there. I'm getting there. She's a super aunt. Yeah, she is. She uh, is. She's always, you know, down playing with the kids. Um, I mean, I think they kind of think she's, yeah, like a superhero, a hero yeah. in their <laughs> eyes. And they call her Aunt Lee. Um, so that's kind of her name around in our family is Aunt yeah. Lee. They're my biggest support system. And I know that I would not be able to be who I am and be a Husker if it wasn't for them. And they've sacrificed so much for me. So. It's so cool to like see them in the crowd and you can always pick them out. We have, we have a pretty big family, so you can always pick them out. They're always screaming, so it's so fun. It's so awesome. It's very simple. All you have to do is pick a topic and I'll write you a poem about that. People are kind of baffled that it's that simple. That there also isn't a price to it. I started doing this because I wanted to be a poet. It's definitely an exercise in patience. Uh, there's, there have been days where I've had to wait like five hours for people to come up and other days where I have too many people coming up and I can't keep up with it. I'm using a 1904 Corona typewriter, folding typewriter. It's the Corona 3. It was made for World War I, taking it out into the battlefield and, and writing about the war. And I've always loved just the feel of t writing on a typewriter. It gives me time to think and time to reflect about what I'm writing and it's a very contemplative practice. It seems like it has a personality and it's temperamental and I don't blame it because it's so old. There's a forcefulness to the keys when you press them down so it's almost as if it's more permanent what you're writing because you're producing something on a piece of paper. 
Mommy, what does it say? Well, let's read You're it. getting the reward of writing right away. Want to read it one more time? Okay, it says, Phoenix, wings that shine all the colors known to the eyes. Your wings lose their luster, and you travel to a home away from home to shed your ashes and claim new light. You master the flames, let them embrace you from the fire. A work of art is born, ready to return to the breath of the sun. By Brittany Cordera. It was good seeing you guys. Have a good day. My kids said that they would remember the day forever. Parents with their kids will come up and they'll be like, do you know what that is? And then they become, you know, immediately enamored by it. Some kids will know what it is right away and some others can't really put two and two together that this, you know, the computer evolved from this machine right here. I've seen a typewriter before, but it's kind of fascinating to see an old uh, piece of machinery and now in the time that we're at, before all these new computers were made. Do you want to try it? Sure. Cool. So, so here, let me give you a blank, blank line, okay? There's a quote by Soren Kierkegaard that says, life can only be experienced backwards, but must be lived forward. And I feel like poets, and every artist in their own way, is trying to take life as experienced backwards and make it permanent and put it on paper or paint it on a canvas or write it in the symphony. And that's why poetry is important because people get snapshots of things that they missed while they were living life forward instead of backwards. Yeah, she crochets. Okay. I have an 88-year-old mother. There's not a lot I can buy for her these days. Well, granddaughters have never seen a typewriter in action, ever. <laughs> they were awed at it. I gave her bullet points about her age. You know, she's a mom, grandmother, great-grandmother grew up on a farm, likes to do this, likes flowers, you know, just gave her a little bit of information. Dear Doris, like stars, your threads of light piece together a tapestry of family, immortalized in the night sky, a love that is unbreakable. Your gardens of violet pansies are a gift from God. Each flower is a member of your golden family. The farm life treated you well, taught you true beauty, and strengthened heart. Forever remain the brightest flame that overcomes the darkest days. Oh my God, it's making me cry. That is beautiful. It touched my heart, and I know my mom. She probably won't even be able to read the whole thing. I'll probably have to read it for her. Poetry is a catharsis in itself, and so if I can pay it forward by providing people with catharsis by writing them poetry, then that's a big, you know, gift. That's definitely, it's really nice to do that and awesome. And there's no words, honestly. There's no words to describe the feelings and the, the emotions. I think she's gonna love it. I'm trying to help people realize that poetry can be used for these things. It can be used to bridge memories. Good. We are trying to capture moments and experiences. And a lot of people are sort of, are daunted by poetry because they think it's more than that. But it's not, it's very simple. You're writing the life you're living. You're capturing every moment that is important. Well, as a photographer, the world of rodeos drew me in because it's just such a photo-rich environment. I mean, you have action, you have little kids, you have adults. There's a lot of color. The light is usually great because it's in the evenings. And I, I started out 
with that in mind, just looking at the color and the, the, the action, the wrecks and the, the fury. But the more I got into it, the more I started falling in love with the culture and these people. These rodeo competitors are all driven by one single factor and it doesn't matter if they're riding broncs or bulls or if they're roping and racing, it's all about adrenaline. These are type A people and they're addicted to what they do and they love it. Some of my favorite rodeos are some of the smallest ones like uh, Clearwater. Uh, Callaway is a great little rodeo out in the middle of nowhere. Bladen, which is fairly near Lincoln, is a great rodeo. There is really no judging a rodeo's quality by the population of its county or its city. I found that some of the smallest rodeos are some of the best rodeos. Yeah, I did take tens of thousands of photos and it was tortured weeding them down to the finals. There are some photos that I love in the book um, a lot. Uh, some of them involve the little kids at the rodeo. A lot of them are, are real close calls that I happen to catch this split second of chaos uh, that the human eye can't really comprehend. And that's, that's why I was in it in the first place. I, I just wanted to catch that total chaos, that, that frozen frame where nobody can really understand what's going on unless they, they analyze it in, in a photo. Well, I would hope that when people see my book and, and read what I wrote about the rodeo crowd and the sport of rodeo, first of all, that they have a better understanding of it. There are a lot of misconceptions about rodeo. You know, mainly though, I think I would like people to see what I saw in rodeo, what drew me to it, and that is the sheer beauty of the competition, the sheer craziness of it. And there is a lot of craziness in rodeo. And uh, the family atmosphere, all these things that sort of make Nebraska great is sort of summed up in the sport of rodeo in a way. Watch more Nebraska Stories on our website, Facebook, and YouTube. Nebraska Stories is funded by the Margaret and Martha Thomas Foundation.